Okay, this week's Sky Cricket podcast comes on the day that England are announcing their provisional 15-man squad for the T20 World Cup in, in the Caribbean and America. That uh, tournament basically takes place throughout June. Uh, England have to announce their provisional squad today, uh, but have until May the 25th to, to make changes. That's, that's when they have to finalise their squad. So that's going to be the main topic of uh, our discussion today. Uh, Nash, you're in Chelmsford, I take it, in the West Wing today? I am in the West Wing. My lad's working in the East Wing for the better Wi-Fi. He's working from home. I've had a good week. I've been to Chelsea Arsenal or Arsenal Chelsea to watch them win 5-0 and watch the North London derby yesterday on that sofa behind me. In the last 10 minutes, I was shouting at our goalkeeper, you are not in North London. Where are you? I am in Grasmere, of all places, <laughs> up in the lakes. Um, I took a few days off and came with four old uh, mates from college and we're starting the great, I don't, you're not really a, a walker, are you, a nature person, but I the don't great, know walking. okay, well, the, the great coast to coast walk that uh, Alfred Wainwright kind of discovered or made his own, um, it's a very famous walk and it starts at St. Bee's Head on the west coast of England in Cumbria finishes at Robin Hood Bay on the east. I'm not going to get all the way across in, in five days, but we have walked 70 kilometers in three days. Um, How's the weather? Very weather? Weather very good. First day, right. coastal walk up at St. Bees, beautiful and lovely yesterday, uh, which is when we got up to the top through Ennerdale, looking down on Buttermere, driving horizontal rain today. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got so, what well, you had a, given a week up there because last time I spoke to you, you were at Old Trafford for some kind of unveiling of all the great and good of Lancashire cricket. And we are up there on Friday doing a championship game. You stayed yeah. up north, have you? We are, yes. Yeah. So I, I came up after that uh, Hall of Fame dinner, um, or a few days afterwards, and I'm, I'm here for five days and then coming down on Thursday evening just in time for our first televised game. As you say, it's Lancashire uh, against Kent at Old Trafford uh, on Friday. But there was um, an interesting postscript to the, to the point you made there. I was at Lancashire for the Hall of Fame dinner. It was very nice to see some old mates there, like Bumble was there, Paul Allert, Jack Simmons, John Abrahams, Peter Lee, who has been inducted into the Hall of Fame, and Frank Hayes, all these kind of, uh, cricketers that I, I regarded as my heroes when I was growing up, really. So it was very nice to see some of them. But on the morning, uh, the morning of that, I, I kind of, I was staying at the, the, the hotel at Old Trafford and I drew back the curtains later on about, you know, mid-morning and I looked out and there was a match going on. The second 11 were playing and I was watching for 10 minutes and I thought, Christ, that's Fred Flintoff batting. <laughs> <laughs> I looked up at the scoreboard and it said, ah, Flintoff, Rocky Flintoff, who was in the process of making 50 uh, and then made 100. Um, and boy, oh boy, the resemblance is absolutely uncanny, both in his mannerisms, in the way he kind of walks around, in the shots that he was playing. You'll have seen the clips on social media where they kind of put together some of his shots and some of Fred's shots and uncanny resemblance on the pull, uh, and the kind of the, the hit over the leg side. So it was very completely, nice. Completely different from you and your boy then. <laughs> Josh McCary's control spinner, which you were never a control spinner, and plays a lot more shots than you, that is for certain. So, Do you know, the, the, the weird thing is, though, is I, like I've seen Michael Vaughan's lad bat a little bit, Archie. A lot of these uh, sons of were not, would not have seen their fathers play. And yet the, some of the mannerisms are very inherent. So people sometimes say to me when they see Josh like stood at the non-striker's end with his legs crossed and his hands on his hip that, you know, he resembles some of the mannerisms that I had. But of course, he never saw me play. He wasn't born until after I stopped playing. And Rocky wouldn't have seen that much of, of Fred play. And yet, you know, some of the mannerisms are strikingly similar. Anyway, he's only 16, nearly 17. So to get a 50 and 100... Uh, for the second team at, at, at that age, suggests he's a serious prospect and a serious talent. And, yeah, well, fingers crossed for him and for Fred. Uh, it's not an easy thing watching as a parent, as you well know, Nas. No, it's, it's no, I was thinking of similarities. And, of course, I still remember 
umpiring your lad Joel's birthday game when he was eight years of age. age. And he ran his mate out and then stormed off in a strop. And I thought, well, <laughs> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree there, there either. Yeah, he, do, he does have some similarities, doesn't he? <laughs> I've, been watching, I've been watching some county cricket by you've been walking the coast-to-coast walk or whatever. And England boys have been going really well. It's been a really good week for England, hasn't it? Um, Root and Brooke, both with 100. Duckett with a double 100. IPL, Bairstow and Jacks. Good time to start getting in form for the England batters in particular. Yeah, well, we'll come on to Duckett and others because that that is obviously the key uh, announcements that England have made today and obviously a good time to score runs when the selectors are sitting down to pick, even though it's a different, totally different format. But yeah, double hundred for Duckett. Good to see Root and Brooke back in the runs for Yorkshire because they failed uh, both innings actually at Lords the previous game uh, against Middlesex uh, and a brutal Brutal hundreds, actually. I was going to say a brutal hundred for Will Jacks, but of course, Johnny Bairstow as well in the IPL, roaring back to form. And Jacks going to 50 to 100 in about 10 balls, I think. In so, six minutes. It, yeah. it, it, it used to take you six hours if we were lucky to get from 50 to 100. He went in six minutes. That's like make a cup of coffee, come back. I mean, do you think, what what is going on with the IPL? Because we had um, DK on and he said the impact sub has made a huge difference Everyone just comes in and tees off. It's got to be a bit more than that, surely. It's got to be a combination of a lot of things. I mean, the runs are just going through the roof. Well, the numbers definitely stack up that this is the fastest, highest scoring IPL of them all. I mean, each year, you know, the, the horizon seem to expand. The total seems to seem to go up. Um, the run rates seem to rise. And all the obvious reasons that we've talked about many times, the, the, the strength physicality of the modern batter, um, the size of the boundaries, the size of the bats, uh, just the, the brilliance of the batsman chip. Um, but obviously that that uh, substitute rule, the player impact rule that DK talked about, that must be having an impact. Obviously, you can bring in a bowler as well. But if you can stiffen your batting lineup, it has a number of knock-on effects, doesn't it? It means you can go harder at the top, that you don't have to have a, any kind of lull uh, in the 20 overs at all. And you can just keep going hammer and tongs uh, throughout. So we're seeing some incredible, incredible scores there. And a and timely, timely 100 for Johnny Bairstow. We're going to come on to that England squad and he's been picked in it. Do you think they were in any way 50-50 with Johnny or do you think he was always in that squad? I think he was always in it. Um, he'd had a, a tricky winter, hadn't he? A, just for the length of the winter two months in India prior to Christmas in the World Cup, two months in India for the Test Match Series, and then two months for the IPL without, you know, great returns uh, within those three different series. But I I feel that he was always inked in at four, actually. I think they've, you know, they think Butler and Salt at the top, and Jacks and then then Bairstow four. But just, just before we come on to that, a couple of other things, actually, I wanted to... Um, just touch on before we talk about the squad that they've announced. Since we chatted, the women's Tier 1 teams have been announced as well. And there was a little bit of uh, debate around that. They announced eight with Yorkshire and Glamorgan to join later on. But the uh, the passing over of Yorkshire elicited quite a lot of comment, given that it's, it's the kind of most cricketing county uh, that there is uh, in England. I was looking at some of the numbers, you know, over... 800 clubs, 300 women and girls teams, 127 of those clubs have uh, women's teams. Um, so it's a big call to, to, to leave out Yorkshire. Um, and that certainly surprised me. Did it, did it surprise you? Yeah, haven't they been told in a couple of years' time yes. that they will get it? But it was a big surprise. But if you went, you shouldn't go on social media, but everyone, every county that was overlooked, Kent, obviously, were overlooked and there was quite a few from there saying that was a surprise. Sussex and Hove have done so much for women's cricket over the years were overlooked. I was, it wasn't quite the Wainwright walk, but I was on that walk uh, for Essex um, from Leighton to Ilford and the phones were going off and they were all beeping and something had obviously happened and it was on the day the announcement that Essex had got it. And I was actually part of, I put in a a little paragraph to try and help the cause, really, because my daughter's been through the you system. Sure, it helped the cause. I, absolutely, I think I think that was the message everyone was getting. That was the turning point when they read that one para. 
but it was like um, you know I've seen what they they've done for girls cricket, women's cricket, the infrastructure in Essex. So um, whoever missed out will be hugely disappointed. And Yorkshire, as you say, such a massive catchment area, such a massive cricketing history to that place. More disappointment off the field for for Yorkshire cricket. Absolutely, but I think they're determined. Well, as you say, they've been told that they will get that, um, you know, become the ninth or tenth uh, tier one team. But they're they're dis- determined to keep pushing things forward. Uh, having spoken to people there, and and the, and the other story that's rattling around in the background is is the um, the conversation around the injection of private capital in, into the hundreds. So last week um, there were two key meetings: one on Tuesday uh, and one on Thursday. Uh, Tuesday was a kind of meeting between some of the host venues and some of the non-host venues, and then a meeting of all the 18 first-class county uh, CEOs and chairs. I think they've got broad consensus. I'm not sure actually that they've nailed down the details and the specifics quite yet. There's another meeting coming up this week. Um, forget and forget I- what, where we're at at it. I, I mean, I find this very... Dull is the wrong word because it's very important. The finances of cricket is very important. But I read about it a lot in the last month, six months, a year about where the hundred is going, where are the finances again, private, you know, equity coming in. What, in your opinion, you are quite good at these things and you have written extensively about it. In your opinion, what is the best thing for the game? Because county members are getting concerned about their counties and the county structures and whether they will have a say. But obviously the finances of the game, I read you, I think you'd written about Gloucestershire and Bristol. There are some counties, Middlesex, where your lad plays. They are been right on the edge. So the game is at a really difficult point financially. What do you think, from a, if you had a clean slate, blank piece of paper, what do you think is the best for the game? Well, you're right, first of all, about some of the, the financial issues. Gloucestershire lost 1.2 million. Five counties are known to have taken advance payments from ECB over the last couple of years. So I, I've always thought, Private investment was an inevitability. I want, that was the whole reason for setting up the 100. That, that was the, the kind of only reason for it, really, to provide a vehicle through which private investment could come. So it seemed to me inevitable. Um, I, I believe that the, the choices between private injection of capital into the teams or the competition, if you remember last year, there was that offer from Bridgepoint or the year before last, can't remember which, 300 million for 75% of the tournament, valuing it at about 400 million. But they've decided to go more the IPL way, which is selling uh, the teams. The, the, the problem is how fair that split of money will be. Because if you think that at the moment, all 18 counties and MCC own the 100. So if you value it at 400 million, roughly everybody's got a 20 million stake in it, just say. Now, the moment you hand back a majority share to the host venues, Surrey, MCC, sitting on London venues, then that distribution is going to make things much more unequal. And I think that has been the basis of a lot of the discussions this week, how to make that split more equitable or how to give the non-hosts a continued interest in the competition and a continued interest in growing it. We'll see where where the where they come out in the end. But in terms of private investment, I mean, you, you need to have some checks and balances there, I think. You know, we've seen issues in all sports about ownership. You know, there's good owners and bad owners. Now, how you put checks and balances in that. And also you have to you have to have some checks and balances around first class cricket. You don't just want to bring in private investment and then all of a sudden that swamps the whole season and first class cricket, you know, is left by the wayside. So whilst the argument at the moment is how to share the money around, there are still some significant arguments to have on the back of that around protecting some of the bits that we still find uh, valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and to and to not and to not forget the people, the genuine people, you know, that have carried cricket, that love their cricket, the people that pay to go through the turnstiles, the members of various clubs. Don't forget about those people. Well, that that's very interesting because I think there's going to be a mid-May deadline by the time the counties will have to tell the ECB whether they they agree with the general proposals. 
But some counties like Lancashire and Middlesex have said this is a board decision. This is not a member's decision because it's a, a decision on the finances of the game, not necessarily the, the cricket side of the game. But all these counties will have two weeks to consult with the members. Now, one assumes that it will vary from county to county how much of a say members have. But on our first televised game, which is Lancashire against Kent on Friday, Friday and Saturday morning before that game, there's going to be a members forum at which the club are going to you know, tell the members what's going on. So uh, we might actually earwig on that. And, and, and certainly I can go and join because I'm a member. I, I, can, I can pop in and see what's being said. But also for members to realise that this could be, you, their natural reaction might be, if I was one of those Essex members that have been there watching cricket for the last 40 years or whatever, your natural reaction would be to fight against it. My only advice to members would be, and who am I to advise members, but would be not to go down that road and have that natural reaction because in trying to save your club, you may be doing it harm in the long term because it will need the finances at some stage. Every county is going to need these finances. And this could be the way, the you know, private equity money coming into the game that will in the end save your club and uh, and keep it moving forward. So it's well, an interesting... I think interesting we'll have a bit more detail the towards the end of the week and certainly, you know, we'll get a flavour of what the conversation is between the club and the members when we're up at Old Trafford on, on Friday. So it might be a timely a timely thing to be there uh, for that first televised game. Should we talk about England's announcement today? Their um, 15-man squad, it's a provisional squad, so they can change it. <laughs> they've not they've not done what they did before the last World Cup in India, the 50-over squad, where on the day when they announced, should have announced the provisional squad, they announced the finalised squad, but then had to change when they brought in Harry Brook for Jason Roy. So they've kept to the, the provisional squad, uh, but it's, I've just written it down here, it's Butler, Ali, Archer, Bairstow, Brook, Curran, Duckett, Hartley, Jax, Jordan, Livingston, Rashid, Salt, Topley and Wood. So, first of all, no great surprises there. There's no real bolter that nobody has thought about that suddenly have been picked by the selectors. Probably, if, if we were going to pick 15 names, we'd pretty much come up with that kind of 15, wouldn't we? Yeah, I mean, it was just like the balance of the side, whether you'd want the extra spare batter or you'd want another sort of bowling all round. A given number of injury concerns in the bowling attack with the likes of Wood and the Topley um, and obviously Jofra Archer. You'd say that Jofra is the headline act, isn't he? He's, he's the headline there completely back into an England squad, um, play hopefully in some of those four games. I'd be surprised if he played all four against Pakistan and get ready for the World Cup. It's great to have Jofra back, fingers crossed. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, fingers crossed for him. Um, he definitely will uh, improve England's side if he's available because he's a, he's a multi-phase bowler, isn't he? He can bowl quick with a new ball. He can come on and, and bowl thunderbolts in the middle of an innings for an over or two if you need it. And then clearly uh, his ability at the death to bowl Yorkers. So that would be a, a big thing for England. I mean, it was always the plan, wasn't it, with Archer? I know that England have been accused in the past of slightly rushing him back and they're taking a very, very softly, softly approach with him this time. So it's going to be a, a, a year of white ball cricket only and T20 cricket only. And then if things go well, next year they'll be thinking about, you know, that test series against India, which is then the, the precursor to the Ashes uh, in the winter. So it's following their laid down plan. And as you say, fingers crossed it. It's been a, I mean, for him, imagine what it's been like for him. You know, people will say, well, he's getting paid and all that. And of course, but you know, when you, when you're a professional athlete and you're not playing and an injury keeps coming back. And I would have thought for a fast bowler, in particular, an elbow injury, um, that's a, that's a hard thing to contend with when, when you, when you love playing. And you could tell, you know, how much he's been through. He did an interview recently or a podcast where he said he, he's not sure he could go through another. So if he has another injury, I'm sure he will try and dig deep. And that's the thing you, with all these injured cricketers, um, it's the thing we don't really get behind and talk about enough. Those dark days of rehab and gym work and, you know, more x-rays and scans and more bad news and comebacks. And then you think you're on the road to recovery. Um, and then it doesn't quite happen. So we wish Jofra 
well because he is absolutely box office. The other thing I want to talk to you about, and you mentioned it earlier, about you didn't think it was a surprise, and I agree with you, that the four batters in there at the top of the order, so you're talking Joss, Butler, and Salt, you probably after what happened in the Caribbean, they're going to open. Will Jacks, after what happened yesterday, probably yeah. at number three, best of four. You'd say all four of those would like to bat in the top three, if not open. Is it an issue with Bairstow at four, or would you see Brooke at four, or even Duckett at four? Because Duckett's the spare batter, and the absence of Ben Stokes, who said he wasn't going to be considered for this, the lack of left-hander, would Duckett come into that side as a left-hander, or is he just a spare batter? Well, it's interesting. I, I was I, When you see a, a provisional squad of 15, I'm always saying to myself, well, what's their likely strongest 11? And then you, you work out your, your spare slots, if you like. So I, I thought they'd go Butler, Salt, Jax, Bairstow, Brooke, Livingston. So you've got a couple of left-handers in there in, in, in Moen Ali and Sam Curran that could float if you need to. Uh, but I agree with you that, that the one issue there in that top six, if that is the top six, it's a right-hander heavy top six. And, you know, they always talk about matchups in T20. And of course, some grounds might have one shorter boundary there might be a hooli blowing across the ground, and it's nice to have the option of mixing left and and right handers. So I'm sure that played to Duckett's advantage. I think there's they feel he's a he's certainly an excellent player, a spin excellent sweeper. There was some talk about whether he's got that six hitting potential that like some of the others might have, um, but no doubt his left handedness uh, played to his advantage there. But who who would have been the option? I think you know somebody like Max Holden actually is not can't be far away. I was looking at his strike rate in the blast last year, um, and he—I think he, he was striking at 184 in the blast last year for Middlesex. So I think he's somebody whose T20 game has come on rapidly in leaps and bounds. Um, Tom Cole Cadmore was probably in the conversation. Jordan Cox maybe, who's just moved to to your club, but in the end they probably just thought, well, Duckett's been around the team for a year or two. He's obviously made that transition to, to international cricket pretty well. Um, and if he's not in the first choice, first top six, if you like, then he's he's a, a good spare batter to, to have. Yeah, and a good player of spin. And I think spin is going to have a role in the Caribbean. It really is, especially as the tournament goes on. You may get some tired pitches. Um, so hitting square of the wicket as duck it does. And also remember, for all we talked about, the scores going through the roof um, in the IPL, you know, there is no impact player. It's an ICC event, and people may just have to rein it in a fraction. I don't, you know. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think it's quite interesting, isn't it? Obviously, there's a stats department in the ECB, and they will look at these franchise tournaments very closely with a view to seeing what the trends are uh, and, and, you know, how you can use those in, in your own game. But I wonder whether now with the IPL, you know, Rules that are not replicated in international cricket, the double, you know, two bouncers, impact player rule. That is skewing the stats uh, in a way that are not easily replicable because they're different, you know, the rules are different in international cricket. So it's kind of some of the statistics around the IPL have a little asterisk against them at the moment, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. That's where you've got to be careful. I think. Keezy himself, when he worked for our stats of a practice, I think was his headline, was the way he described. The other thing, um, Af, I want your opinion on is who keeps, because another rule change that's just come in with the ICC is that stop clock, hasn't it? 60 seconds to start your next over and there's a penalty. I think you get a couple of warnings, but there's a five run penalty. So they're trying to speed the game along. And if Butler's keeper and he has to go up Woods 40 yards away and go and speak to Wood about his feet... And also what's good for Butler, you yeah. know, what happened in that last 50 over World Cup. Who who do you think should keep and where? how do you think they'll go? Well, I, I think they'll just, if I was Matthew Mott, I'd just say to Josh, what, Josh, what do you want to do? It's as simple as that, you know, and if, if you're more comfortable and, and feel that it's going to be to your benefit and the team's benefit uh, to be an outfielder, then, then Salt can keep wicket. But, I mean, surely Josh knows in his heart of hearts what he wants and what he thinks will be best for him and the team. Uh, and therefore, him he's the main man, isn't he? He's the captain. And he's such an important player at the top of the order. And as we've seen, as he's come into form uh, in the IPL, he, teams are just, it makes a massive difference when Josh, Josh Butler is playing well. 
Yeah, uh, and with you know the experience of captaincy now, I, I do think personally, I think whatever Joss feels like, you just say whatever's best for Joss. If for England to win this thing, and I've been looking at some of the squads and some of the sides that have been announced, my word, to win... I mean, A-T-20 is a lottery anyway, but to win this thing, some of the sides out there... I know that's an obvious comment, it's a world tournament, but I think this is going to be the hardest because you look at the host nation, the West Indies, you look at South Africa with their batting lineup. India are coming on the back of this IPL and the players they've got in form. So, listen, there are some apps. Australia looking for the, the treble of 50 over, 20 over, and you know, ICC test champions as well. As well, I'm not sure you can judge them as uh, in, on whether they win this tournament because, as you say, T20 cricket is more of a lottery. It's very difficult to call the winners. Generally, we've felt throughout the last 10, 20 years of 50 over cricket that the strongest teams have, by and large, won the tournament. Uh, and you, if you come into a 50 over World Cup on a good run, top of the rankings, you can have a fair bet that you're going to be there or thereabouts at the end. But I think in 20 over cricket, that's not the case. And therefore, what what they have to be judged on, Martin Butler, I think, in this tournament, is just getting some of most of the decisions right. You know, I don't think you can be guaranteed to win it, even if you do. But you want to see evidence that the ship is run well. And I think what was evident from India in the 50 over World Cup is that too many things went wrong that were in their control, whether that be strategy or selection, decisions that they were making from day to day. So they've got to have a better tournament in that regard, but I'm not so sure that even if they do, you can be guaranteed to win it, A, because it's a lottery, and B, because there are a lot of other good teams around. The narrative out there at the moment is that they're both under pressure. Do you agree, Martin Butler? I think so, after the after the 50-over World Cup. So, I mean, Matthew Mott's first tournament in charge, they won it. They won the T20 in Australia. It was a terrific start for him. Um, but you know, thing it was such a a, a bad defence of the fifty over tournament, and so many things went wrong almost from the start, and, and not much went right throughout that six or seven weeks. That I think they are under scrutiny uh, for, for this tournament. Um, and the other thing is, I, I think I wrote a little bit about it today. It's quite hard to kind of get a sense of where a team is in, in a cycle, isn't it? It's much hard, you know, when McCullum took over the test team, it was obvious that the test team were right at the bottom of the of the down period and there was only one way to go. Whereas when you, you come in like Mott did with a very successful one-day team, you know, running smoothly under Owen Morgan, um, there's only one way to go really. But you know, they're still, they've won the, T, the 2022 T20 and they're gradually bringing in fresh blood. So Brook and Salt came in for the last T20 World Cup. Will Jacks is a, is evidence of that this time. So they're gradually bringing in fresh blood, but trying to keep a nucleus of player. I added them up. There's 11 players in, in this, seven players, I think, in this squad who are in the 21 and 22 squads. So they've still got that experienced nucleus of, of the team. One of those young guns coming in is uh, Tom Hartley. Um, is that purely, I mean, it would have been between him and Ray and Ahmed. Do you think that's because they want the left arm spinner? Obviously, Adil is the wrist spinner. You've got Mo spinning it in. Do you think that? And you've got a lot of off spinners. You've got Jacks. You've got Livingston that bowls both leg spin and off spin. The one thing they're lacking is the left arm spin option. I think so. It would have been between those two. I think Tom Hartley really impressed them in India. I know it was the Test Series, um, but I think he impressed them uh, with the way that, you know, he kept going under pressure there. I'm not saying Ray and Armour didn't, by the way, but just I think that they were very impressed with Tom Hartley. And, and, and you know, he came to prominence, really, for Lancashire as a, as a T20 white ball bowler. And they took a punt with him for the Test matches, and it was a punt that came off. But, you know, he made his name really in T20 um, and I think if, if they feel the pitches are going to spin in the Caribbean, they like the fact that he bowls bowls at pace, bowls it quickly, and drives it uh, into the surface. So, um, yeah, and uh, and what else? I mean, Chris Jordan or Chris Wokes would that have been the, the final the, the, the final conversation there? Jamie Overton. There's a lot of talk about the selectors liking Jamie Overton that they were keen on him. He's got this back injury, and I don't think he's being scanned or assessed for another couple of weeks. They have to wait for that injury to settle, and then he gets scanned. So you're very close then to the deadline. 
Um, so in the absence of him in that kind of all rounder slot, and obviously Stokes, um, I guess it was it was Jordan or Wokes for that last slot, was it? Yeah, well, I I almost I was asked to do my side, and I had them both in because I thought I wouldn't have taken like the extra batter because there's so many batting options in there. Um, so I would have probably gone both because you are missing a, a wonderful all rounder in Stokes. So Chris Chris Jordan, brilliant, you know, in all phases, he's brilliant in the field. He scores very useful runs down the order, obviously returning to the Caribbean as well. That'll be a special for a World T20. England won out there, didn't they, in 2010, although not many of this squad uh, will be put, would have been part of that. But it's just, you know, they, they have some good memories of the Caribbean in general. It's a great place to play cricket. It's going to be a great tournament. Their first game's against Scotland in Barbados. Yep. Um, so, you know, we wish them well. Um, I can't think of many other talking points with that squad. Can you think of anything? Uh, no, I mean, it, it's a, as we said, it's a fairly predictable squad, strong nucleus of experienced players, bit of fresh blood with the likes of Will Jacks and Tom Hartley. Um, very tough competition around and a tough tournament to win. But that's, as you say, that's not for a while yet. So the May 25th deadline is the deadline for the final, t uh, final squad announcement. I think that means that they'll only play one of those matches against Pakistan before having to name the squad, the finalised squad. So, um, yeah, they're, they're not going to get much of a, a chance to see people. I mean, what, it'd be interesting to see what some of, the, some of them may well still be away on IPL duty. Rajasthan are flying high at the moment. So you think, you know, Joss may well be away as captain. So what they do with Butler, I always think, even as captain, I, I think, you know, playing cricket and playing IPL cricket, you know, and playing big game cricket, is what it's all about. So if people have to be away finishing off their contractual obligations. I'm absolutely fine with that. Um, the days of getting getting sort of prickly about you should be playing for your country and all this sort of stuff. It'll give other people an opportunity to have a run out and, um, you know, it'll get more people in form because some of those cricketers there would not have had a lot of cricket. Adil Rashid, for example. Not played since not, February. Not played since February. Um so those four games, for some of them, those four games are going to be um, absolutely vital. Um, well, I've got a bit of walking to do before. Well, when you said earlier you've been writing, have you been like taking your laptop and stopping on the top of a mountain and writing a piece? Or How do you think I'm doing this podcast? It's, it's coming from my laptop in, in a hotel in the middle of Grasmere. There's absolute panic about the Wi-Fi signal, which didn't seem to exist in the middle of Grasmere, but I, I found one. Um, and I have put, I put my laptop in the rucksack. We're just walking from pub to pub, uh, rucksack on your back, 10K is on your back, good for the fitness. Um, and tomorrow we're heading to somewhere near Shap, I think. I went on a geology field trip to Shap. When you, when you get to Old Trafford, end of the week, I'll tell you all about the geology of Shap, the good old days of Durham University geology field trips. They're absolutely brilliant. So it, it's Shap and then Kirkby Stephen right on the border of Yorkshire. I'm not going into Yorkshire, I'm just stopping <laughs> on the border of Yorkshire and then getting the train down. So I'll see you in Manchester on Thursday evening and it will be good to do some broadcasting again because uh, we haven't done any for a little bit and it'll be good to have a look at Lancashire and Kent Um Lancashire had a dreadful game against Essex, didn't they? Got well and yeah. truly stuffed by your mob. Uh, but hopefully we'll uh, put on a show uh, in front of their own supporters at Old Trafford. Um, if you make it. It'll be, I'm looking for if you make it. You know, well, we, we don't want to be a man down. So good luck and I hope you can get to Old Trafford. I, I will be there on Thursday evening getting the, the, the flyer from Penrith down. And I look forward to seeing you and Ward and Butcher in the bar. Um, <laughs> good luck with that. Inevitably. Okay. Um, right. Good to see you. I'll catch you on, on Thursday evening. And, um, well, I, I, our, next week's podcast, I, I suppose we might reflect on some of the events at Old Trafford because, as I say, that members forum will be pretty interesting to hear the conversation, the club, tricky conversations, no doubt, the club are having with their members. Anyway, we'll catch up with that at the weekend. I'll see you. See ya.